Well, here it is, the Xiaomi Mi Notebook Pro. A lot of you have been waiting for me to review this one. Bought it from Trading Shenzhen. It is, of course, an import model. This is the top spec one I got. So the Core i7, the NVIDIA MX450, and it has the 512 gigabytes of storage. And all models have this amazing OLED screen. It's the best screen I have seen in a notebook to date. Color coverage is brilliant. It has DC dimming, deep blacks because it's OLED, and it's even quite a bright screen too. So in this index review, I'm gonna cover all the bases here, even take a look at a little bit of gaming performance, thermals, everything that's important so you know exactly what you're getting if you are considering buying one of these. Now the weight of this laptop, this one is 1.8 kilos and I measure 16 millimeters the thickness. With the charger, the weight is just over two kilos, which is not bad at all considering it's a 15.6 inch notebook. The lid has this nice matte finish to it with the alloy, and you can get a dark gray version too, which probably does look a little bit better than this one, but it will pick up the fingerprints. This tends to not really show fingerprints at all. So we have the Xiaomi right here that is set into the metal, so it's not like a sticker or anything like that. It won't come off. And lifting up the lid, I can do this with one hand, and the hinge is good enough there that it can open right up, see, without any problems doing that one-handed. So this keyboard is very nice to type on. I like the feel of the keys. They have about 1.5 to 1.6 millimeters or so of travel and good feedback that you do get from them. The spacing around them means that I don't really get many typos with them. Now you notice here that we do have this AI button. This is the Xiaomi AI button. Now once you uninstall that Chinese software, pressing it, for example, now, does absolutely nothing. The power button is located here and it has a built-in fingerprint reader, which does work quite well, I find. And it is, of course, faster than typing in a password. Overall, there's been no missed keystrokes. And when I do tap around here, you can probably hear that a little bit, that the space key is a little loud, but the rest of the keys are quiet. And the touchpad here does not rattle. And this keyboard does have a backlighting behind it, of course. So the distribution of those lights behind the keys, pretty good. You can see the shift and in enter key and caps lock, maybe not quite evenly distributed there. So two different levels of brightness. That is it off, and that is the lowest level. And the second, which I keep it on all the time. Palm rest made out of alloy, just like the whole build of this particular laptop. And it is a very nice touchpad, this one. Nice and large, it has a smooth finish to it, supports gestures, of course. And I've had no issues with finer, more delicate movements with the mouse cursor. It doesn't jump all over the place. It's a very good touchpad and of a reasonable size, too. On the left of the laptop, we have our Type-C in here for charging. So power delivery support or the 100 watt charging. It is very, very quick and in about an hour and a half or so, it fully charges. And we've got a status LED. So this one flashes when it is charging and it's fully lit once fully charged. 3.5 millimeter combo jack here. Very good quality out of this. And on the right, just two other ports, type C's as well. So we're missing that type A and there's no micro SD card or SD card reader, which I would have loved to have seen on this model. So this one does support Thunderbolt 4, which is good to see. In the box, they did include this Xiaomi, which is a type C to HDMI with a type A port here. So if you were wondering, how do you get the HDMI signal? How are you gonna plug in a TV or monitor or a normal mouse? That's why they give you this adapter, but it is going to be dongle and adapter life with the Mi Notebook Pro because of its only Type-C ports, which is a shame. And then on the underside here, we've got the four rubber feet. The ones at the rear are slightly higher just to improve the ventilation. So this is all the big vent here, all the fresh air gets sucked in. So don't block this, whatever you do, otherwise it will thermal throttle and get too hot, could end up damaging it. Down with firing speakers. And then we have these T5 Torx screws all around that hold on the rear cover. So there's some good and some bad when looking at the internals here. These are the two downwards firing loudspeakers and there's a little bit of a gap around here so they could have possibly gone with a larger battery although there is this inner frame that is holding this battery that clips into place. Now the quality of this frame is really good. It's quite a lot thicker this alloy that they've gone with. So a larger fan here, the two connected heat pipes so both of them covering the GPU and the CPU side of things. And then the GPU has a smaller fan on this side. So we can upgrade the wireless. We can change our NVMe drive, but we cannot add a second one. Remember the previous models had two slots. This only has one now. And just under the shielding right here is our RAM. So that's 16 gigabytes of DDR4, 3200 megahertz RAM in dual channel is all soldered those chips on. So there's no upgrades there either. And overall, the quality is excellent, very, very good. 
and everything is screwed into place, and they've talked up all the screws in the factory to a sufficient amount. They're not loose. And this is the inside of the lid here, so note that there is no thermal pad on the back of it, or a plate, to connect to the SSD to help keep that cool. A lot of manufacturers do that, but it is missing here. So what about that screen? It's an absolute stunner, this one. 15.6 inches, 3.5K, and it is fully laminated OLED. Now this OLED has 100%, so they claim DCI-P3 color coverage. Now sRGB, 100% right here. NTSC is 97%, Adobe RGB, 100%, and P3, that is 95%. So hands down, this is the best for the color coverage that I have seen on a display. But what I really like the most about it is DC dimming. So this means there's no flicker. I'll lower the brightness right down and it will not be flickering away like we would see with some other screens. Now on camera, it does show like a little bit of banding coming through, but in person I'm seeing no flicker whatsoever. So maximum peak brightness that I'm measuring, which I currently have it on right now, is for 540 nits. Now they do claim it can do 600. For me, it's just a little bit under that. But overall, this is probably the best screen I've seen in a notebook, the best 60 hertz screen. I really do like the slim bezels left and right, and the top bezel that contains a one megapixel webcam. And here's what you can expect out of that webcam. So I don't have my studio lights on. I just have normal lights on at the moment, like most people would inside their house. And it's rather grainy, not particularly good quality, 720p only. The microphones, however, they do sound good. The dual ray mics that we have either side of this front-facing HD webcam. The bias that the Mi Notebook Pro here has is like the others. It's completely locked down. There's only just a few things you can change just under the power setting menu right here. Type-C power, you can get it to support non-PD delivery and the keyboard backlight mode, you can have it continually on. USB charge, boot and secure boot, that is it. So of course when you get this, if you're going to buy the import version from China, which I did here, that it will all be in Chinese. So to fix this, what I did was go in here, but when it was all in Chinese, to system, you find then where you can change the edition. And I added my Windows 10 Pro key, it downloads Windows 10 Pro, and then finally I can add an English language pack. But to get around all of this without having to spend any money, if you don't have a license key already, is just to simply install, do a fresh new install of Windows 10 Home, and it will work, okay? And you need to get the drivers off their website, and you can find those in the website in Chinese. You need to enter the serial number, and it's pretty straightforward. So my model here is the top spec version. So I've got the Optimus graphics switching between the Iris XE and then the NVIDIA drivers here. You can swap over to that, of course. And I will be updating the drivers of everything on this particular system. You can see it's a little bit dated there that it's version 457. And I have the 16 gigabytes of RAM, which all systems, in fact, do have. So in Device Manager here, just to point out a couple of things, the fingerprint reader already tested it out with Windows Hello, is working well. Uh, we have a one megapixel camera. The processor is listed, of course, eight times because it has eight threads. It's a quad core, maximum turbos 4.8, and it is a 35 watt part that is in this. And you can control the power limits. There's a different, well, it's function and then K to swap over from silent to balanced to turbo. And I'll be using turbo in this review here. So the internal storage is a 512 gigabyte version that I've got here, NVMe, and these are the speeds. They're not as good as, say, a Samsung, which we could have, say, the PM981 or the newer drives there would be a lot faster than this. But it's okay. It's still a lot faster than SATA 3, that slot, of course. So this is the Core i7, which is that 35-watt chipset that I just mentioned before. But just point out that I have checked here, and it is running at the 35 watts. And if you're a little bit curious about the differences here with that Tiger Lake, with the Iris XE graphics it does have, it has the 96 executional units, which are like the cores for it. And that is why the performance is so much better than the 16 and the 24 that we had before that would be with the Intel UHD integrated graphics. So I did update the latest drivers here of NVIDIA for that MX450, and it is version 466.27. So the system is incredibly quick. Everything I do is very, very fast to open. There's no delays, as expected for a quad-core. And video playback here, 
just to show an example, this is 4K, 60 frames per second is really good, no problems, no lag there at all. And the Jellyfish test file, this one is HEVC 10-bit, 140 megabits per second, so it is a very demanding clip, but it handles it with absolute ease, as you'd expect. So other basic things like documents, spreadsheets, just absolutely fly, so there's no point in me showing you that. So Cinebench R20, the score I got here was 2,330 points, which uh, is not bad. So that is just below that of an old desktop 7th gen from Intel, the 7700K. I used to have one of those myself. So that is impressive that the laptop's able to get that now with the 11th gen. So we are getting just some advancements there, as you can see clearly there. So Time Spy. Just over 2,000 uh, points here. That means that the MX450 is not exactly a powerful GPU. It's only got the 2 gigabytes of gra uh, RAM there, so it is quite limited. Why does it say this? Graphics card is not recognized. Well, that is because of the new driver. For some reason, it is saying that. It's just not recognizing it 3D Mark. But I wouldn't worry about that too much. And here is PC Mark 10. So 5,453 points is reasonable. I have seen higher, and that would be out of some AMD machines that can get scores of 7,000 to 8,000 points there. But I think it's still very good. Very good there. It's just let down in a few areas. That's all compared to the AMD chips. Now, there will be a version of this particular laptop in May, apparently, which we're almost in. Well, as the time I'm recording this, it's not May just yet, but hopefully we're going to see it soon from Xiaomi. So here's Fire Strike. This is 4,835 points. Now, this I did a slight little overclock to 500 megahertz on the RAM and just 50 on the core of that NVIDIA MX450 to get that score. Now the stock score is then 4,325. Again, not impressive. Graphics score here is very kind of low and it's not a gaming machine, but it does help us and help out a little bit over the integrated graphics. And then lastly here for the synthetic benchmarks, Geekbench 5 score, very good. Impressive. That single core score there, really, really good over... 1500 and the multi-core score there again that is really good almost 5100 4k video editing so this is a timeline here that has some 100 megabit 4k clips from my sony a6400 and the timeline does seem reasonably quick now i have the playback resolution here just set to a quarter i'll try it now on a half and it does seem to be running at 30 frames per second matching the timeline there that playback is good and I have noticed with these basic edits that this general performance I find to be pretty good. So export times, I will test them out now. We'll see how long it takes to export with the normal preset that I use. As you can see here where my mouse cursor is, one minute of footage. It's set to the 4K YouTube preset. Start on the timer and export about a second delay there. Okay, it is almost done, and you can see here, I've just brought up the task manager. It's not using that much of the GeForce MX450, only about 10% max, mostly CPU here. And there we go. So you could say that that is about 2 minutes and 20 seconds, which is a terrible export time for this. Now, if you want much faster, just using the integrated graphics, the XE, will give you results that will be around about a minute, which is so much quicker than using the NVIDIA MX40, the 450, sorry. But the 450 does help in the editing process. It doesn't help on the export speeds, however. Now we do have the two downside loudspeakers on this and they are okay, but after all, they are laptop speakers. So they're not impressive or anything like that. There is a tiny little bit of vibration coming through at 100% volume, but here's a sample of them. At 100%, see if you can pick up on the distortion, the vibration that comes through a tiny bit. And on to the fun part here. So gaming, this is Cyberpunk 2077 and we're looking at a playable at 720p lowest settings around 40, late 40 frames per second, dipping down to about 40 here. So this is good to see and it is getting very hot. So I have seen the CPU get up to 98 degrees. It throttles, then it drops down to about 70. So just before it throttled. GPU temps are looking okay here and this performance is a lot better than the Redmi Book. So the Redmi Book Pro that I reviewed, the 14-inch model, I do have the 15-inch model on the way as well. 
That didn't do so well here. It was really throttling a lot, and it only has a single fan, so the dual cooling is definitely helping here. And the thermals are looking like they are stabilizing a little bit here. So what I'll do is just uh, get into a car and see if we're going to get any big frame dips. But at 720p, this is looking very, very playable. So that is great to see here. And yes, the GPU is helping. Now, if I was to swap over to the Iris graphics, the integrated graphics, we would be looking at about 20 frames per second, 19 frames per second down to 18, which is not playable. So it's the difference of having the NVIDIA MX450 between playable with demanding games like this and simply not playable if you only had the integrated graphics with this particular chipset. The Witcher 3, now this is set to 720p and the frame rate is good. Now the fans are constantly on but you can see 92 degrees and it will again peak 95 now, it will peak at 98 throttle, it already started to throttle now and it affects the performance a little bit and the GPU is still getting a little hot too, 74. I mean, 74 is not too bad, but normally they're a lot cooler than this. So good performance. I mean, 90 frames per second, 100 frames per second here with The Witcher 3. I know it's an old title, but it's still quite a demanding one. So this is very, very playable. So what I'll do now is set the resolution to 1080p and see how it performs then. All right, so it has halved the frame rate. We've gone from 100 frames per second to about 60 now. So just over half. And I still think that even at 1080p lower settings here, this is still very, very playable and smooth enough for most people. If we can achieve here in the town close to 60 frames per second, when you are out in the wilderness with this game here, the frame rate does increase. I'm just in this area that is pretty heavy on graphics because it's got all the NPCs around as well to calculate. And that's why I like to test out this area. So it is looking good for the performance, just so much better than that Redmi Book Pro 14, which was just throttling the whole time like crazy. Counter-Strike now, so this is on 1080p lower settings, and it's looking pretty good here, around, as expected, it's a light title, around 200 frames per second, close to it, so that's looking great. Let's see how long I last here. Not very long, whoa, almost got a kill there. Oh, I can't believe I didn't kill anyone there, so. Terrible gameplay, I know. My aim is shocking really, really bad. Okay, so that was pretty easy for them to shoot me standing out there in the open. But a light title like this, good frames per second. I did also test out Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I managed to get with the in-game benchmark 47 frames per second, 1080p, on the low setting preset, which isn't too bad considering it is a low-end weak GPU. The game at least is still playable. Thermals, on the other hand, not so good. So it peaked at 98 degrees Celsius, thermal throttling, and then just above the keyboard and the middle of the keyboard reached 52 to 50 degrees, 53 degrees Celsius, way too hot. As for Linux support, I did attempt to boot a Linux Mint distro and I could not get it to work. It would come up saying this Intel error. So it seems at the time of this video, Linux is not really supported and hopefully that will change in the future. Battery life performance. So it's only a 66 watt hour battery, which is, it's not huge considering it's got a high resolution screen, it's got a bright screen as well, and then the spec that's on offer that's inside this. I can get around six and a half to seven hours, maybe even a little bit more if I use a lower screen brightness. So I was testing with about five to seven Chrome tabs, and I was doing just general light work, a little bit of streaming, and that's how you'll be able to achieve the seven hours. So it may just make it through a full day for some people on the battery. That is of course on just the Intel integrated graphics, the Iris Xe. If you are doing anything demanding and it swaps over to using then the Nvidia MX450, the battery life plummets then. That uses quite a bit of power and you're only looking at about two and a half hours then running it just with the dedicated, dedicated graphics there. So what about the general build and the overall experience with this. It has been really good. It's a nice laptop to use. It's great. I mean, 1.8 kilos is not the lightest for a 15 inch laptop, but it's still not bad. But the build quality, the metal alloy unibody they've gone with, the CNC machining is just a huge step up from the previous gen. And then the hinge is great. There's a lip around the outside of the lid here, and it's very, very nice. But I cannot stress this enough here, that this panel is absolutely fantastic. It is hands down, full stop, the best 
OLED screen, or even just the screen in general, 60 hertz that I've seen in any of the notebooks I've been testing out. Yes, it's only 60 hertz. So if you want the 90 hertz, you have to go for the Remy Book 15, which I will be reviewing, the 15 Pro. But it's fantastic. The color gamut it has on here, the color coverage, 100% Adobe RGB, sRGB 100%. Very, very good here. And the brightness is great. It's 550 nits. However, it's glass covered, super reflective. And why on earth does it not have touch support? I mean, come on, like I always say, if it is glass, if it's glass, give it touch. It needs touch support. And I want to see that hopefully in an additional model or maybe the revision that they'll make. So there's a few areas of letdown and that is that inside, while we have the two cooling fans, one is a little smaller. That's on the GPU side of things. GPU doesn't get as hot, but because they are connected the thermal transfer heat pipes on them, they end up affecting each other. So thermals are not good on this. The fan noise is great uh, under normal kind of use. On the battery, I don't even hear the fan. In light work, I can hardly hear the fan at all. Now, when you're gaming, you will start to hear the fans. And it will, if you push it hard, something like Cinebench or editing video or exporting videos and things, it will peak up to 98 degrees Celsius, which is simply too hot. The keyboard with my thermal imaging camera gets up to 52 degrees Celsius right in the middle. Just above it is 52, sometimes even 53 degrees. So very, very hot. That's another problem there. So unlike what we had with the other models, we cannot add an additional NVMe drive, which is a real shame. I really like that option we had with the previous generation. That's gone. We've also lost the SD card reader. We've lost uh, type A ports, so you have to use adapters and dongles for every single thing with this, which is really quite annoying. It's just type C only. We do gain, however, Thunderbolt 4 support, which is fantastic, great to have. Super fast charging, so in 30 minutes it gets up to 50%, and then it takes about an hour and 20 to an hour and a half to fully charge the 66 watt hour battery. So it's a bit of a mixed bag, and there always has to be something, doesn't there? It's just the thermals that really put me off with this one. So if you intend to use it to its maximum, push it hard, expect it to get really hot, thermal throttle, and you're just not gonna get the performance you paid for, sadly, with this model. So thank you so much for watching this long, yes, long-winded, in-depth review, but I hope I did answer everything you need to know, more or less, before considering buying one of these right here.